Yeah, okay. I won a jump seat here, so uh, my talk was not in the program, but I have to substitute for uh, whatever there was. Um, <laughs> I want to speak about, uh, I want to speak to you about uh, hill forts and how to modeling conflicts between regions and hill forts and how this could affect flows of goods and probably drive urbanity. So there's a lot um, to do, so we better start. So, um, hill forts. Um, when I refer to hill forts, I mean Bronze Age hill forts. This is especially in uh, Middle European archaeology a long-standing topic. And they come in all shapes and sizes and also appear in a very broad time frame. So, just two examples to show you the, how diverse the phenomenon can be. This is the Hoynischenburg near Kronach, which has a stone wall fortification, which is uh, always doubt to um, have Mediterranean, um, what do you say, like uh, forebuilder uh, idols, which, which um, tries to draw inspiration from the Mediterranean fortifications. And on the other side, we have the Itz near Bockfingen which um, is also a Bronze Age hill fort, which later becomes a princely seat in the Celtic Age and then even the Celtic Opida. So we have short-lived ones, long-lived ones, and a lot of things, but they have stuff in common. Um, to just illustrate the diversity of hill forts a little bit more, here are three um, hill forts which are all dated to the um, late Bronze Age. And I also mapped all the um, settlements that could be dated more or less to the late Bronze Age. I mean, there's always like a little bit of problem of dating the open settlements. But we see that like the Hönschenburg is very alone in a very isolated um, area with no settlement pattern to it. While we see for the Edenburg, it has a very dense um, settlement pattern next to it. So um, we can argue that hill forts have different functions, have different origins, and also appear in different settlement landscapes. Um, if we talk about urbanity, we can define it in a broad variety of ways. And the classical way to do it is, with function, is through functional definition. So we have certain types of buildings with specific functions. We have a world of space. We have a degree of planning. We have monumentalism, which is often attributed to the walls to be monumental. Um, and we have traces of an elite. And if you go through the papers, they're also always very narrative. So depending on the author, this could be a trace of the elite. The other saying like, no, nah, we have the weapon burials, that's the elite. No, the wall itself shows there's an elite building it. So um, there's not much of quantification to it. So it's more like a checklist archaeology. You take your side and you try to fill the checklist and somehow it becomes monumental, uh, urban. <laughs> So, nowadays we have the sociological definitions. Um, so, urbanity is characterized by institutions and activities that aim for a broader hinterland. This is a very recent um, definition. There's also another one which is very popular, especially in Iron Age archaeology now these days, is a numerical significant aggregation of inhabitants that fulfill a set of functions for the hinterland. Um, I tend towards the first one because uh, I see the, the numerical significance Aggregation is a little bit problematic, especially in prehistoric archaeology, because how many people really inhabited a hill fort, we absolutely don't know, because most of them have not been excavated very well, or not excavated, um, how you say, not much space is excavated, often only the wall is dated, or the fortification itself is dated, but the, the inner area has never been touched, or we have some geomagnetics that shows a lot of post holes, but we don't know if there was a numerical significant aggregation. Um, and then we have a lot of umbrella terms that have been applied, like pro, pre-urban, proto-urban, semi-urban, they have traces of urbanism. So people try to get around the definition and just attribute something to it, to say like, it's a little bit urban, but I will never say it's urban because then I have to give a definition and discuss it. So <laughs> we can close with this, urbanism is a murky term. And probably we should ditch it, but it's always uh, very easy in archaeology to ditch a term and then to come up with the next umbrella term, so we we'll stick to urbanism. But what I, I will try to do is to connect it with urban flow theory, which comes from um, spatial geography or from sociogeography. Urban flow theory argues that urbanization is a process that starts in space and flows of goods drifting through space towards an area. And goods can be raw materials, finished product, peoples, ideas, innovations, or some authors even say it's just energy that goes through space. 
Um, and these streams, these flows of goods can accumulate in a certain area and causing changes in the economic and social space. So this is a very important part. Keep that in mind when we're coming towards the model soon. So here's um, an example. This is Black Rock City. It's a contemporary city that's built for one week each year in the Black Rock Desert and it's the site where the Burning Man Festival happens. And this city hosts 80,000 people. And you can see there is a certain degree of planning. There's a street layout. We have all these different roads. They even have road names. You can have an address, like my tent is here and there. Um, you can see in the middle there's like these half rounder thing. Um, there's the central camp. In the middle of it all you can see the man that is burned during the Burning Man thing. And people build a temple. So we have all and everything that we need for the checklist. You could go in and fill the checklist and say this is an urban place. Um, you have monumental architecture, you can see down there, this is the camps that people build that they live in for the week. But also, we have these flows of goods, because 80,000 people come there, so they bring stuff there. Be it the alcohol they come to during the festival, be it their tents, be it other stuff. So, um, just to keep this in mind, an urban space can be very contemporary. Don't try to um, connect it to long-term standing settlements, even in prehistory. Maybe we have urban places that pop up be not very resilient because they are dependent on these flows of goods and they might just disappear and then collapse again. Um, so I'm very arguing in favor of seeing urbanity also as a contemporary phenomen phenomenon. So flows of goods can accumulate in a certain area and causing changes in economic and social space. I just brought that up to make it clear again. And these change in spaces can lead to the formation of new institutions. And institutions regulate conflicts of interest and stabilize the various spaces so the flows of goods still come in, uh, stay come into a space. Um, and the concentration of institutions will eventually lead to a more dense urbanized area like a city or an opida in the um, Central European Iron Age. Okay, so this was all very, very theoretic. Let's try to show you on this image. Let's see, this is the population um, in Bronze Age, and they are all connected to macro socioeconomic um, networks. So they need bronze to come in, and they will trade off like the uh, agricultural surplus to get bronze and make new tools. So the population will be divided into two groups the bound to place people, this being the farmers that cannot leave their land, that cannot easily move, and the other ones might be the metal workers that could possibly go to another area and do their trade. And the bound to place people being mostly producers, while the mobile people being mostly distributors. And in the classical mobile by Taylor, he gives them attributes like flexible and conservative. I would be careful with these, but the mobiles being a little bit more flexible. Um, and so the mobile people thinking more global, they, start, they try to stay connected to the networks, while the bound to place people are acting more local because they cannot change. They are interested in safe borders, a safe space, a good hinterland where they can live in. So these are drifting forces, society is drifting in two directions and they need a superior institution to regulate the conflicts and rule them. And I would argue that hill forts being the expressions of these superior institutions. So um, I will try to prove in a model that hill forts can stabilize regions and therefore might play a key role within the urbanization of space as they will allow flows of goods to traverse more safely to the space that they actually safeguard. And to model this, I use the prisoner's dilemma. And um, are you all familiar with game theory and the prisoner's dilemma? We can make it. Okay, so I will go through it very shortly. Like um, in the classical prisoner's dilemma, we have two people that rob a bank together. And both of them getting caught and they were put in separate cells and they have um, um, a variety of options. Both of them could confess so both of them will get like a five-year sentence. Um, but one of them could remain silent while one com confesses. And that means that the one who stays silent is getting a 20-year sentence. So, um, and then you have the various, um, uh, both varieties, player A stays silent, player B stays silent. And then last but not least, you have both of them remain silent. So they both just will get one year term of prison because it could not be determined who actually holds the weapon during the the bank robbery. And um, we can also uh, put this in more general terms like cooperate and defect. So whenever we have an interaction between humans, 
you will um, act to a payout matrix. And the payout matrix um, depends on if you will cooperate or defect. So if both players cooperate, they will both get like a payout of four. If um, I'm cooperating, uh, no, if I'm, is this the right one? If, my, if I'm cooperating and I'm defected by my opponent, so I will get nothing because he just takes everything and I go bankrupt. And the other way around, if I defect my opponent um, who's cooperating, then I will take um, the gain from him and have a higher payout. So um, there's a variety of strategies that could be applied because we play this game over and over again. And so there are more cooperative and more aggressive strategies. Um, this is just a rundown of different strategies. You see the always cooperating strategy means I'm always cooperating. No matter what happened in the round before, you can defect me over and over again. While on the bully strategy that you see down there, I will more or less always be defecting on you, no matter if you're cooperating or not. Um, we can give them numbers, the different strategies. So the very corporate strategies have very low numbers. Always cooperating is a one. Bully strategy was, was an 11. So you see here just a round up of the various strategies that could come. And in our model, each, pa each patch chooses a strategy every round. It calculates the gain and it checks for the most um, successful strategy within its neighbors and then adapts to it. So um, these are some screenshots from the NetLogo model. And you see the um, so-called tit for tat strategy number five is very prominent here, if we can remember for a long time. If I don't allow my agents, my patches, to remember the strategy we played before, it's a much more colorful one. But this is not like humans interact. We know what happened to us like last year, last month, last week. So this is not a very um, vital um, thing to see. So if hill forts have their own payout matrix, they lose less through defection. This is like the main um, thing I put in the model. So here we see the payout matrix for the hill fort. We just skip that to be a little bit faster. And you can see now the patches could build a hill fort. And um, they do it the way that they calculate the threat level. So they analyze what strategies the patches surrounding them choose and might answer to this um, if they have enough gain, uh, in enough gain from the other rounds to build up a hill fort. And what actually happens is we have two outcomes of the model. We either have these hill fort landscapes where we have hill fort next to hill fort because one patch decides to build a hill fort, the next one evaluates the um, um, evaluates the threat level and builds a hill fort and builds a hill fort. So in this outcome of the model, every patch that could afford it builds a hill fort within two or three rounds. And we have another outcome that often happens. We have a very dis dispersed set of these hill forts. So um, I have not yet um, checked if this is an artifact of the code or if this is like two outcomes of the model. But if we look at the archaeological record, we have more or less these more dispersed hill fort landscapes. So, Number one must be wrong somehow. Um, but what we can also see is that the hill fort um, changes the strategies applied by its neighbors to more cooperative strategies. I cannot defect on a hill fort patch that often. So these landscapes tend to be um, more friendly, more cooperative towards each other and towards the neighbors than the, um, the patches not affected by hill forts. So Hillforts force the neighbors to tend towards more cooperative strategies. And this leads um, to the following outcome. If I'm modeling the flow of goods by a simple A plus pathfinding algorithm through space, these flows will traverse next to Hillforts more often. The Hillforts themselves playing a bully strategy all the time. Once they have the gain, they just start to hit on the neighbors over and over again, while the, while the neighbors always cooperate. You will hardly ever see people play tit for tat with the hillfort, like I indicated on the on the upper right corner. So um, flows of goods traverse to spaces near hillforts far more often because um, in our model the traders going on with their goods with their metal wants to go through patches that are cooperative because you will not trade with a bully. And um, as flows tend to traverse near hillforts more often. Hillforts could be considered an institution to stabilize regions and therefore play a key role within the urbanization of space. So conflicts can lead in an outcome, once they're resolved through an institution, to urbanism. Thanks for your attention.